Okay, good morning. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I am really excited to be doing this first ever virtual language and literacy institute. Um, I am um, missing the cheese plate that Gail normally would have, but um, hopefully you've got some nice coffee at home and you are ready to snuggle in and talk about some writing this morning. Oops, sorry. My name is Stephanie Summers. I work for Minneapolis um, Public Schools Adult Education. I have two roles there. I am the writing curriculum team lead and I am also um, the adult diploma coordinator for our program. I also do some consulting work for Atlas um, and my email is here. If you have any questions at any time um, about the session, you can certainly reach out to me. Um, and you'll see that again, I think at the end as well. So there are a few learning objectives um, that I wanted to go over for today. Um, one of them is we're going to name some strategies for engagement encouraging student production and providing feedback. So those three things. We're also going to locate some resources and tools to use in the classroom. And we're gonna reflect on, um, on what you and other writing teachers are doing to support your uh, students during remote instruction, particularly in the area of writing. All right, so I thought um, I would start by just providing a little bit of information about my own writing class. So um, my class meets just one day a week. We had kind of a schedule um, change up due to distance learning and my class is only on Fridays from 8.30 to 12.30. Um, so I have a class that meets once a week for four hours. Some of our other writing classes meet um, Monday through Thursday, and they have about six hours of instruction a week, I believe. Uh, my enrollment hovers around 30 students, and my average class attendance is about 16. My class is a mix of native and non-native English speakers. And in my program, all of our classes are conducted using Schoology conferences. We do have a core textbook that we use. It is the Great Writing series. Um, there's a little picture of it there in case you've never seen it before. Um, generally speaking, especially because we only have class one day a week, I try to assign some work for students to do between classes so that um, they get additional practice. And students connect with me using Remind as the primary communication tool. Come, Remind and of course email, but a lot of my students have gotten comfortable using Remind, which is a messaging app that um, we're finding very helpful in my program. All right, so I wanted to start out this morning by sharing some what I'm calling inspiration. This um, is a lesson that I taught in my last class, which was last Friday. And the lesson is based on uh, the inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb by the poet Amanda Gorman. And this lesson um, comes from PBS NewsHour. Um, Lindsay, thank you for chatting that out. So if you wanted to check it out, you can see the link there in the chat. So the poem is, a, um, her poem is called The Hill We Climb. And in the lesson, we ask our students to talk about, um, well, we, we started out, we read parts of her poem. I didn't have my students read the whole thing because it's fairly long. So we read, um, I would say maybe the first, um, maybe about the first third of her poem. And then in the lesson, we talk about, um, we want students to write their own version of it, talking about the, the hills that they climb. And so in order to do that, we wanna identify who is the we and what is the hill. And then I told my students they could write a poem 
or if they chose to, they could just write a paragraph because paragraph writing is what we're a little bit more familiar with that explains what obstacles um, you think the we face and how we might overcome them. And I will tell you when I introduced this in class, a couple of my students said, the hill is writing. Writing is hard for me. So my hill right now is writing. Or some of them said the hill is uh, learning how to speak English. And then they talked about other things as well. Everything from the hill is being a minority, the hill is being a woman, um, the hill is not having enough education, those kinds of things. So we spent a good amount of time talking about the poem, discussing some of the language, and then setting up this idea that they were going to write their own versions. And the students had about 45 minutes to write at home. And I wanted to share with you the poem that one of my students produced. And I'm going to tell you, I will not read it out loud because when I tried to do that in class, I started crying and I can't have that happen right now. So I invite you to read it. Um, and I just kind of wanted to start out this way because I found this very inspirational and I thought it was, um, you know, a nice way to begin this conversation today. So I'll pause for just a minute to give you time to read. When you're finished reading, if maybe a couple people wouldn't mind putting something in the chat like done or go on, that would help me. I don't want to advance the slides too soon. Thanks, Jim. Okay, we'll give it maybe 30 more seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you. So yes, yeah, so actually she submitted this as a Google Doc and I thought it was just what you see on the left of the screen. So I read it out loud and I was doing okay. I was holding it together. Then she said, no teacher, there's another page. And when I got to the second page and the part about the luggage, I <laughs> could not go on. And so um, this was one of the most, uh, just amazing things that's ever happened to me in class, all of the stories and all of the writing the students did. So I wanted to start out just to kind of give us all an idea of what's possible with our writing students and how powerful our lessons can be. All right, so the first thing I wanna really talk about today is um, how we might be able to create community and collaborate in a virtual classroom. And so some of the things I'm gonna talk about using breakout rooms and using discussion posts. So again, my program uses Schoology conferences to do our remote instruction. Um, but I, I think that some of the other um, platforms, of course, allow for breakout rooms. We're using breakout rooms in Zoom right now. And I think discussion boards are fairly um, common as well. All right, so one of the things that um, I have found really uh, helpful when I'm using breakout rooms is to make sure that I have the directions clearly written on the screen and then making sure that the students can still see those directions when they go out into their breakout rooms. Um, I've also started doing a few things in class, like I taught my students how to change their status icon in Schoology. There's a way that you can change your icon to uh, something like I'm away, because what would happen is we'd go into a breakout room and I would think I had this many students in class and then it would turn out not all of them were actually 
in front of their screens at the moment. So we've kind of tried to develop some routines around making sure that you let the teacher know if you have to step away so that, you know, when I put you into a room, it doesn't turn out that someone's alone because the other students aren't actually participating. So making sure that you, everybody who's in a room is actually active right now, making sure that the directions are clear. Um, yes, Emily, and I was just gonna say, and making sure that you kind of provide some support when you do an activity like this, it, helping them to explain what they are and are not looking for. So yes, if this is an activity I call a fix it paragraph, and I started doing these last year. In our book, we learn about several styles of writing. They do like descriptive writing, comparison writing, writing a definition paragraph, um, writing a process paragraph. And so we learn about the different um, structures of those types of paragraphs. We learn about the transition words that are most common and um, when I do these fix it activities, it's really not so much about the grammar, but about looking for those other things, making sure there's a topic sentence, making sure there's a conclusion, making sure all of the details actually support that topic sentence. So this one had to do with a process paragraph. So it's explaining the process of planning a party. And I put students um, into a breakout room and I have them look for the mistakes. And another thing that's become really helpful in the breakout rooms is helping the students learn, in, again, in Schoology, in a breakout room, the students can actually take control of the presentation and they can turn on the screen annotating um, tools. And we'll see an example of that in just a minute. So having someone who can kind of do that so that the students can um, mark up the screen is helpful. And then of course I pop into the breakout rooms to make sure that students know what they're doing and there aren't any questions. So this is one example of a task that I found successful in a breakout room, having them, the students work together to kind of solve a problem, if you will, or identify um, the issues in a paragraph. Okay, here's an example of another activity that we've done. And the purple, um, the purple text on the screen is, that's what the students were able to um, add. And if you look uh, towards the right of the screen, just at the edge of the SNP, the picture, you can see what I'm talking about. Those are the tools that Schoology allows you to use, the user tools. And so the students have different um, like pen options, they can add a text box. And if someone in the group knows how to turn those on, then they can do annotating when they're in their groups. So this is an example of an activity using a graphic organizer. And we did this around um, using sensory language to describe. So on the left side, um, the first column in the chart, just the different, our five senses. And then the idea is the students think about things that could be described or things we experience mostly using those senses. So an example um, of something we experience with our sense of sight would be a sunset. And then adjectives that describe it, purple streaked majestic, and then at the end, they're sort of supposed to make a sentence that combines the noun with the adjective. And so a couple other things I found helpful is before students go into breakout rooms, if they are supposed to be using anything like this, like a chart, I give them time to copy the chart at home on a piece of paper, at least to do a quick sketch so that when they get into their breakout rooms, everybody does have something they can write on at home. Everybody should know, you know what the directions are and everybody's ready to get to work. So those are a few of the ways. And, and I guess, again, I just find that it's helpful if students have a specific task in a breakout room. If I were doing a listening and speaking class, for example, um, the students would probably, um, 
you know, be doing discussion questions in their breakout room because that's not the kind of class that I have. I've tried to come up with activities that would encourage collaboration, um, but also help them to focus on writing. Please, you guys continue to use the chat if you have questions or comments, and then you're gonna have a chance to talk about this in just a little bit. This is an example of using the discussion posts um, in Schoology. So the little icon of the two conversation bubbles means it's a discussion. And there is a resource, um, and I actually wrote about this for the newsletter this week, the ABE Connect newsletter, um, the 365 days of writing prompts um, that Lindsay just chatted out is a great resource that literally gives you an idea of something to write about every day of the week. So the first two things you see here, writing about a talent and if your house were on fire, uh, both come from that resource. And I like doing discussions because they can provide a little extra writing pro um, practice for students. I think they feel a little less high stakes than being asked to always write a paragraph or an essay. And it's a way for students to kind of get to know each other a little bit. So in Schoology, they can post and other students can respond and I encourage them to do that so that they kind of start a dialogue with each other um, sharing their ideas and opinions. Another example of when I've used the discussion post is in collaboration with the New York Times, what's going on in this picture resource. And I have talked about this before, so maybe the resource is not at all new to you, but every week um, the New York Times posts a picture stripped of its caption. Um, Ah, so Emily used the same picture. Yes, I mean, how could you not use this picture? It's Minnesota, it's winter, there's a man in a lake. Um, we had just been talking about using our sensory language to describe, and there's a lot that you could focus on here um, for that. Um, so the directions, what they, um, yes. <laughs> um, so the directions that the New York Times suggest is that you ask your students to think about what do you think is happening in this picture? What do you see that supports your idea? And that you try to find evidence from the picture. Um, so for more advanced students, you can start to set this up as making a claim that you support with evidence for a little bit more like pre-GED students, we've used this to talk about fact and opinion. So a fact would be, what do you see? So for example, there are four people in the picture. The opinion would be, you know, what do you think that means, for example? And so we used this one recently of the man in the water. And then here are a few, these were my directions. So you can see the directions at the top. And then here are a few of the actual responses that my students um, posted. So during a cold winter day, there was a game of hockey going on and it was being played on a frozen lake under a bridge. I accidentally fell in during the game while I was keeping watch of the game. I was told to take off my shirt for safety precautions. I was extremely cold out there, about 25 degrees, and I felt like I might freeze to death. A woman with a pole came a few minutes after the others called for help. One of the hockey players took a video of me stuck in the frozen lake. After the lady helped me get out of the lake, and I was extremely cold once I got out. After that incident, I don't ever want to be near a frozen lake or river again. Okay, so. Yes, this, um, you can see um, the first one was kind of just a story. The second one, they use a little bit more of the sensory language. Imagine that I am the man in the water and I am under the corner, the corner right of the green bridge. My waist down is under the freezing water and I feel my legs and feet too cold. And in the palms of my hands, I feel the cold from the ice entering my veins as my hands are supporting my body to not sink me into the water. Cold air hurts my nose when I breathe it. I feel that it is not fun. I see three men, a man is in the back of me and he is taking my picture maybe. The other man is far away 
something, me, and carrying for a fishing rod. He is looking at me. The third man is a little bit far away and he is in front of me and he is holding a hockey stick. He is laughing while watching me in the water. I hear cars driving on the bridge. I can also hear the man's laugh. Imagine that the man's feeling, just by that I can understand his feeling being in the freezing water. So you can see in that one a little bit more of the sensory, talking about what she feels, what she hears. Um, we also were using some prepositions of location. So she's got corner right there. Um, so you can see, you can generate some pretty nice writing um, just by using the pictures and some minimal instructions. Okay, so now we're going to do our first breakout room. And this breakout room will be a little bit longer um, than the others. For this one, we're going to give you 15 minutes because we'd like you to spend the first few minutes introducing yourselves to each other. You will come back again to these same breakout rooms. And so um, do you know share your names, maybe where you work. The only caveat is if, if, anyone, if anyone leaves this amazing session during the session, then we might have to re, uh, re, reconstruct the breakout rooms a little bit, but I'm hoping that doesn't happen. So once you go into your rooms, you will still be able to see in the chat the questions. Um, you're going to have 15 minutes. Lindsay, thank you, Lindsay, just chatted out the questions. So if you have your chat box open, you'll see them. So we're going to spend the next 15 minutes kind of talking about how you can build community and encourage collaboration in your own classrooms. All right, we are ready. So we will pause the recording here and um, we'll, we'll be directing. So yep, as you return to the main room, you're going to want to remute yourself. We can turn off our videos. And I wanted to ask folks, I was very unsure about how much time people would want in breakout rooms. I think um, it's great to have time to share, but I wasn't sure uh, what the exact right amount of time was. So if anyone felt like the breakout room was too long or too short or just right, if you wouldn't mind putting maybe a comment in the chat, we could always adjust it for next time. I just, um, I want folks to have a chance to share because I think that's so valuable, but I don't want people to feel like they are, um, you know, not engaged. So if anyone had a comment about the breakout room or if you wanted to share, um, great. Thank you. Thanks, Shanna. That's what we thought. And the next two will be just a little bit shorter. Um, so hopefully you had some good, great. Thank you, Emily. Good, great, great, great. Teachers will find anything. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So yeah, and if anyone wants to share something that you talked about in the breakout room, um, you could put that in the chat. Um, oh, wow. That's a, I have never thought about a formula before. Three to five minutes is, okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Good. Then I won't be concerned about it. Okay. Excellent. Well, we are going to go on to um, talking about something related. Um, we're going to talk about encouraging student production. So um, oftentimes, my students, um, they're great with doing grammar. They're great with doing kind of structured activities like the ones that we've just looked at. But sometimes when it gets down to actually producing their own writing, we can have trouble, especially now with distance learning. Um, great. Thank you, John. Yes, I, I agree. You know, we do not get to see each other that often. Um, and so getting a chance to connect and see some faces can feel, you know, I think like it feels like normal, right? Uh, which we need. We need some normal. So um, right now we're going to talk about some ways to encourage student production. And so three of uh, three things that I've been trying. Um, providing some supports like sentence frames or using some of the Google Suite tools 
I have had some success with, um, success with. There are also a couple of ready to use resources that you might be familiar with, but it's, I think never hurts to mention. Um, we're gonna take a break after we talk about the digital tools and then we'll come back and finish off this section by talking about some less techie versions, um, having students write on paper and take a photo, which is another thing I've done in class. All right, so I am going to start out talking about um, using some sentence frames. Um, so earlier this fall, um, maybe like many of you, if you have a writing class, um, or even if you don't, but you were, uh, if you like to participate in journeys, the the Literacy Minnesota, as I'm sure you know, every year publishes a book of adult student writing called Journeys. And they always do a call for submissions every fall. And in fact, the deadline to submit this year is this Friday, it's tomorrow. Um, so I was trying to get my students um, interested in submitting something. Um, and to start out that conversation, I was showing them some of the uh, writing from previous years. And so the student on the left, Khaled, that's a student who's in my writing class right now. So I was able to use something he submitted last year. The story on the right was just a story I paired it with. They're both kind of about snow and winter. Um, and oh, thanks, Marisa chatted out how we could submit to Journeys 2021. Um, and so our program purchased a digital copy of last year's book. Um, and so here are, I just took a couple screenshots of um, two of the selections, as I mentioned. And then the way I set this up was I we read them and then I wanted to practice doing a little something more with these. And so we used them to practice making comparisons. And so add, the students read the two texts and then the directions were, let's write a sentence that compares these two texts. And then we use this sentence frame. Although both authors write about blank, these two texts are different because. And so my students mentioned something like they're both about winter. They're both about cold. But one thing that they noticed was different is the one on the left is written in paragraph format and the one on the right is written as a poem. And so that's a great thing to notice and that's a great way to finish off the frame. Although both authors write about winter, these two texts are different because of their formatting or because one is a paragraph and one is a poem. Um, they could also say things, um, other things like they're different because one author is from Ethiopia and one author is from Mexico. It's really anything that they notice and we're giving them some academic language to make the comparisons. Um, and research shows us that uh, sentence stems are sentence frames are great supports especially for ELL, non-native English speakers, because, but for English, native English speakers too, really for anyone who's not sort of fluent in academic language, by providing the structure and that by providing that academic language, we free up the students to focus on their actual thinking and ideas, and they're still producing something that seems academic, if that makes sense. So I tell them how their sentence should look, and that just allows them to focus on what they're really thinking about the two texts. Um, so Emily said, um, yes, they did open a new, they have a new theme this year, um, teaching and learning during the pandemic. And she says one, uh, some of her students, and it looks like Emily herself wrote about that, which um, I think will be really interesting for us to all look at that when the book comes out this spring. Um, and yes, so these sentence frames um, come from a larger text, which you should have the, the link to now. And they have all different kinds for doing all kinds of uh, different kinds of academic, um, practicing different academic writing and academic skills. Another one, here's one. So the first 
the first time we did it, we used the simpler frame. The next time we did it, we used this little bit more complicated frame. So one nice thing about doing this activity with journeys is, as Emily mentioned, the book is divided into sections by theme. And so if you picked two from a similar section, chances are they would be similar enough to compare. Mondo Bookshop. Um, I am not sure. I believe, are you talking about the sentence frames? I'm not even sure. That came from a search I did one time. Um, and I just liked that result. So um, what you see here, both of these um, paragraphs, both of these submissions had to do with relationships. Um, so the one on the left, um, great, thank you, Elizabeth. The one on the left has to do with like a um, mother and son and the son asks his mother to marry him. So it's like kind of a sweet story. Um, and then the one on the right has to do with uh, two people who knew each other when they were younger and then they kind of their lives went different ways and they come back together later in life and they end up uh, having a longer term relationship. And so this time the sentence frame was a little bit more complex. So we have blank and blank are similar in that they both focus on relationships. And the first two blanks, that's to help especially students who might be working on the GED get used to naming their two texts when they are um, doing writing like this. As you know, for the GED, students are given two texts and then they have to compare them. And so this could be a, a way to slowly scaffold up to doing more like that. And so this would be, um, you know, the best proposal and Libby are similar in that they both focus on relationships. However, the best proposal focuses on a relationship between a mother and son, while Libby focuses on a relationship between two adults. Or it could be one focuses on love within um, a family, the other one focuses on romantic love, something like that. So again, the frames, um, provide the academic language and academic support. And this could be used as kind of a pre-step to doing um, more complicated comparisons of two texts, like what would be expected for the GED. So providing the frames, sentence frames um, are a great start. I've also done full paragraph frames for writing comparisons where students are given you know, um, a framework for their introductory sentence, their topic sentence, and then I'll fill in some of the transition words. And that helps them to produce something that is in the correct format while leaving a lot of space for them to focus on their content. Oops, I think I might have gone one too far. Okay, another thing that I have been trying is um, providing like some structure for students to produce writing. And one thing that we came up with as a, a writing team in my program was using Google Slides as kind of a template. And so this was to write a process paragraph. And the idea is the students would kind of put some writing on each slide. And then on the slide, what you give the student is information about what should be included there. So here we have topic sentence. Remember to start your paragraph with a strong topic sentence. Your topic sentence should include your topic and your controlling idea. All of the details in your paragraph should support this topic sentence. Then we have um, step one, and then they would do, you know, um, First, you must lift the car off the ground using a jack. Um, then they would add more information. That's what the expansion explanation or example is. So they might say the best tool for doing this is a jack. Be sure to use jack blocks so your tires don't roll or something like that. Then they would go on and they would add a step two, a step three, a step four, and then a conclusion. And I remind them on that slide some of the functions of a conclusion to restate the main idea, make a prediction, offer a suggestion, or give an opinion. And so 
by kind of giving them this basic outline, it's a way to kind of encourage them to produce more writing, just maybe in a little bit of a different format using the slides. And I would produce these slides as a template myself and then have my students make their own copy and use it uh, as they wish. Another thing that we have tried um, is using a Google form. So you can actually write quite a lot in a Google form. And so I have tried, um, I've tried this where we create a paragraph and then each maybe part of the paragraph could be a question. So what is your topic sentence? And then they would fill it in please type at least five sentences in your process paragraph and add some examples or explanations. And we, one of the things we teach is the PI model, point information explanation. Um, and then what is your concluding sentence? And so um, on the left, that's what the pair, the form might look like. And on the right, you can see one of my student, or I'm sorry, one of my fellow teachers on my writing team was trying this out to see if it worked. And she was, um, surprised by how much text she could add. The downfall that you might see is um, there aren't like spell checking tools. And so again, we were trying to think of different ways to get students producing writing at home, especially students who maybe aren't that great using a Google Doc. Um, Google Forms um, can be somewhat easier to navigate. Um, so these are a couple of ideas of ways you can provide your students maybe a little push in getting started with writing. And then they would just submit this. And the idea is that it gets the writing into the teacher's hands. So from the student to the teacher, and then the teacher could always um, put it into something different in order to make more, uh, to make some, to provide some feedback. You can maybe put it into a document to provide feedback and make comments. All right, and then the ready to go lessons. Um, yes, and Elizabeth points out, yes, as, for many of us, I'm sure our students um, use our phones for use their phones for joining class and having students open a Google Doc on a phone and try to compose just seems real challenging. And so forms can be a lot easier. Um, they don't they don't need to use an app. It works from a browser. So thanks for pointing that out. I also wanted to point out that uh, North Star Digital Literacy um, has some great lessons in their curriculum um, in the Microsoft Word section um, about um, using Microsoft Word, creating documents. You can see here's an, um, a screenshot of some of the scope and sequence. So um, one thing that I know I need to focus more on is actually teaching students how to format a document. And this is great for that. Um, you can see they even get into maybe inserting a table, they cut and paste, they add text and images. And so what's nice about these lessons, of course, is they are ready to go from the North Star site. You can download them. The links that you need are um, embedded in the document and they're a great way to teach these skills while also getting your students writing because that's kind of what they're producing is some, some kind of um, written document. So here you can just see, here's a little bit of lesson seven where they're inserting an image into a template. Um, they're making a brochure. Microsoft has all kinds of templates that students can use and it can be fun to teach them how to use them for an invitation, for a brochure, for a newsletter. Another kind of ready to go tool is from the Google Applied Digital Literacy Skills Lessons. They have all kinds of lessons and they have some search tools so you can kind of search for what you're looking for. But they do have a few lessons just for adult learners. They have lessons that help with doing research, lessons uh, collaborating to tell a story. And so again, these are um, a nice, this is a nice resource maybe just to go and look for ideas. And all of them are geared towards having your students um, not all of them are in this are necessarily geared towards writing, but most of them involve doing some sort of writing and collaborating and also 
uh, the digital literacy piece as well. So um, great resources if you're looking for some new ideas. Here's one from the adult learner section on uh, write using online research. And so the lesson actually takes you through writing a whole research paper from how to do the research, planning a draft, revising, and the example they share is a student piece on Helen Keller. So um, nice complete lessons that can be adapted and also that are just there for you to, to grab and go. Okay. And we have been at it for almost an hour. So we are going to take a quick break here um, and we will be back in 10 minutes. And uh, ta-da, hopefully I'm gonna open up a 10 minute countdown timer here. Um, and so you have 10 minutes. So we'll come back at 1023. And I do hope to see you all after the break. Thank you so much. And I asked everyone to kind of as their homework over the coming week to send me their pictures and their sentences. And then when I started the next class, I displayed their work just like I am for you. And so we looked at this one, for example, and I said, okay, so Let's underline the prepositions and also let's talk about what do you notice about this paragraph? You know, it's a great paragraph. It's got some nice detail, but what is it missing? It has no punctuation. It's all just one sentence. And so then we turned on that interactive whiteboard and the students were able to fix it up a little bit. We put uh, editing marks in to show where we thought the sentences should end and we talked about um, what that would look like. So here was another example of how they approach this assignment. And I think I have one, nope, I don't. Okay, so now we're going to move into some breakout rooms again. This time they will be slightly um, shorter than the last time. And this time uh, the questions are just a little bit different. We're gonna be talking about how you've been encouraging student production in your virtual classroom what routines or activities have you used and how could you use one of the ideas shared so far this morning with your own students okay so you'll be able to see those again lindsay uh, has uh, very kindly chatted those out for us and we will move into our breakout rooms and i will see you back in about 10 minutes Hey, right, so a few of you have come back a few people are still in breakout rooms i think we're going to give it couple little bit more time till everyone is back if you've come back from a breakout room and you maybe want to share something you talked about in the chat you're welcome to do that that would be um, I think everyone likes to see what other people were talking about so if you were in a breakout room and you guys someone shared an interesting resource or someone brought up um, a cool way to get students um, writing more um, or a nice support that you've tried you could put that in the chat and more people will be coming back in very shortly we Oops. should have everybody back with us at this point so. everyone's back okay perfect yeah. All right, thanks, Marisa. Well, welcome back from your second breakout room. I hope you had some, it was not enough time. I'm sorry, John. We are gonna do breakout rooms one more time. So maybe um, if there was a con, and you will be with the same people. So if you were in the middle of something, um, you will have a chance to pick that up in just a little bit. So sorry about that. Um, we are going to move into kind of the third and final section of this presentation, uh, which has to do with providing feedback and ideas for providing feedback um, and some things that I've tried that have worked. So one thing that I um, have come to believe is really important is I ex spend a lot of time um, teaching the explicit uh, academic language around discussing writing. And so at the beginning of the year, we actually do about a two week unit, like I call it a pre-unit on introducing vocabulary like phrase, 
clause, independent clause, dependent clause, and sentence. Um, I make a lot of, well, when we were in the actual classroom, I would make a lot of posters that I would hang up around my room. Um, now in my virtual space, one of the things that I did was I made a, um, this is a jam board, if you're familiar with that. Um, and for this particular jam board, the smaller uh, sticky notes were, um, were the vocabulary words, the larger sticky notes were sort of like the definitions or explanations. And I had my students, you know, moving these around to do kind of a matching activity. I feel like it is worthwhile spending time on this um, because later on then, so it's kind of one of those things where it's maybe a lot of work up front. But then later on, when I'm doing conferencing with students or when we're talking in class about writing, it's the kind of thing that I can constantly come back to. Um, understanding dependent clause and independent clause, at least in a basic way, also allows students to understand about the different types of sentences, simple, compound, complex. And I mean, we don't do a lot with compound, complex sentences. But sometimes when we're doing work, like when I'm displaying um, student samples of writing, for example, I like to, I am constantly coming back to this vocabulary by asking students, you know, do you see an example of a nice compound sentence? Um, here we've got a complex sentence. And knowing that vocabulary also allows me to explain uh, punctuation mistakes or why something is a fragment or a run on. And so I find that it's we come back to it again and again, and it lays a really great foundation for being able to have um, better discussions about writing and helping students to really understand when they've made a mistake, a sentence level mistake. Another thing that I do to provide feedback is I take screenshots. So this um, is, a, these are screenshots of um, my students' work. So the blue part on the top, that's me sending a message in Remind. Sort of the white part underneath, that's a screenshot from an assignment that the students did in Schoology. And so the assignment was identify and correct the sentence error that you see below, studying all night for the big test next week. So I found that I was struggling to be able to explain to my students like if they had a mistake here. So I could take a screenshot of it, send that to them in a remind message, and then I was able to explain what the mistake is. Um, and for the sake of time, I learned pretty quickly, I was not going to screenshot absolutely everything and then send like 50 remind messages with explanations. Instead, if the student made the same kind of mistake several times, I would try to just take one maybe screenshot of that that was an example of the kind of mistake they were making, and then I would try to explain it. So in this sentence, I've been studying all night because I have a big test next week the comma should not go there because when a dependent clause comes first in a sentence, we don't need a comma between the, or I'm sorry, when the independent clause comes first in a sentence, we don't need a comma between independent and dependent. So that here's an example of how we practice that vocabulary and how I can explain to them, this is a very common mistake my students would make, and I want to try to retrain them so they're not putting that extra comma in there, okay? So taking screenshots and then sending them as little messages has been helpful. And I do this in Remind, but I think you could also do it with email. Another thing that people do is they make screencasts. And so I have also had uh, teachers tell me they'll go through an assignment and make a screencast in which they provide feedback for the student. This takes um, a little bit of time, but it's really valuable for the student. And maybe you could pick a few assignments where you thought this might be most useful um, and use the um, 
use this the screencasting. So what you're looking at right now, this um, was part of a presentation that Adam Kiefer actually gave back this fall. Um, a, and he was talking about screencasting. And so here are some links that he provided and some videos that he made um, about how to make a screencast and then screencasting tools. And as Marissa is saying, so right now in the participant folder, you will see a PDF copy of these slides and you will also see PDF versions of anything that is a PDF. So like the, um, the sentence or the uh, the writing prompts document, the sentence frames document, those things are already in the folder. Things that are links um, from websites, I will make a quick uh, reference list and I will add that and it will be in there um, later this afternoon, okay? So that you'll have it with some links. Um, in the chat, Screencast saved my advanced writing class last spring when we went online. I was able to give in-depth feedback on their final essays, five to eight pages each. Yeah, um, personally, myself, I find it sometimes tedious and it becomes too much to add tons and tons of comments to a document. I think they become hard to read. They kind of become confusing, but I can go through and I can talk to them. If I'm making a screencast, I could use like highlighting tools um, to really help the students focus on what I am talking about. Um, another little feature also in Remind is Remind allows you to record really short messages and give verbal feedback. And that's another thing that some teachers have done. Um, so I agree. I think it's a nice way to provide feedback where it's like almost like you're having a conference with the student um, and but they can keep it and replay it. And so it becomes like a, a resource for them as well. Um, here is an, uh, some, again, from Adam showing um, how to make snips. So um, sometimes, like especially if you know your students are using phones and you want to show them what something would look like on a phone, being able to um, take a screenshot of it on a phone um, can be useful when my students are having problems. Often I'll ask me, well, can you take a screenshot of how it's not working and show it to me? Um, and that helps me to figure out what they're talking about. So here are a few more resources um, that Adam provided. And then finally here, this is a single point rubric. And single point rubrics have become pretty much my favorite thing. I love single point rubrics because they are, I believe, much easier for both students and teachers to use. So in a single point rubric, the column down the center is meant to be all of the um, criteria or expectations for an assignment. Creating these kinds of rubrics, I also find helps with um, transparency, lesson or assignment transparency, because students can really see what you're looking for. You could co-create the criteria. And uh, some of my criteria generally stays the same, like that last row, the middle of the last row about appearance that generally stays the same. I like my students to type their work when possible. Um, I like it to be double spaced because I'm old and I can't read uh, stuff when it's really cramped on a page. I like them to do a title. Um, so that is pretty much consistent. What often changes has to do with the, the way they format their content. Um, and sometimes that changes based on the type of writing that we're doing. Um, and so for the rubric that says a uh, pro con paragraph, I specifically mentioned that the students, their paragraph should contain at least two reasons that are pro and two that are con. So that would be specific to this kind of writing. Um, the other one about process paragraph, um, you'll notice the paragraph contains at least five clear steps. They should use imperatives because imperatives is a grammar structure 
that lends itself to process writing. And so I change those criteria. Sometimes I mention using specific types of transition words. Um, so some things are the same. We want no fragments or run on. We want correct capital letters. Some things change depending on the type of writing. All of that goes down the center. And then it's easy enough to provide feedback because the column to the left is where I would note things that are a little bit below the target. And I give specific information or feedback about how they were below target. And then to the right, we can talk about what's meeting the target. So at or above um, expectation, meets expectation or exceeds expectation. I find this is easier for me to use than a rubric where I'm like giving a number score where you have to decide if something's a three, a two, or a one or something like that. Um, I sometimes have my students self-assess first and then I will provide my own version and then we can compare as kind of a norming activity. So there's a lot of different ways to use these rubrics. And you can find um, copies of these in the Atlas Writing Resource Library. And Lindsay chatted out that link. Um, and you could download copies that you could then edit for your own classes. So we've looked at a couple of um, ideas in this section. We've talked about providing feedback using uh, screenshots or screencasts. We've talked about using rubrics. I shared my single point rubric. You might have another kind of rubric that you like. Um, I know in my program, another common kind of um, way to give feedback is the teacher will just say one thing that they really liked and one thing that needs improvement. So pretty simple. Um, some teachers do color coding to provide feedback. So now is your time to go once more into a breakout room and to share some of your ideas around providing feedback, especially now in the virtual classroom. If you have routines or activities, maybe you do peer editing, for example. And then if you have any um, other resources or ideas. So that again, once again, those questions are in the chat and we will spend about 10 minutes in these final breakout rooms. All right, so um, I want to um, thank Marisa and Lindsay who have been such excellent tech support, tech hostesses today um, and able to adjust the time on that last breakout room so that you could have another minute or so. Um, and I do hope that you've enjoyed that uh, opportunity to collaborate this morning with your colleagues and share ideas. We are just about at the end of our session, um, but I did want to invite people to maybe um, unmute we could uh, you could raise your hand if you'd like or you could just unmute and speak you could put something in the chat so it seems like you enjoyed your um, collaboration i would love to have people maybe share an idea that came up um, something that they learned from a colleague some something that they talked about or something they'd like to try in the future. So you are very, very welcome to um, unmute yourself and speak up or you can put something in the chat. Um, Marisa says, if you'd like to speak, you can put your name in the chat. Um, Britt says, it's there have been great tools and conversation. So I'm glad for that. Um, so I just have just there's like one last slide here. Um, ah, I think smartphone is an essential teaching tool. Yeah, and I think it's so important for us. You know, I don't, um, I don't uh, attend classes. I don't attend uh, like Zoom sessions or anything on my phone. But I do think it's important for us to look at um, what our materials and what our whatever we're sharing, what that does look like for our students who are using a smartphone. Um, I tried a cahoots in class right before our winter break. Um, 
it was something I've never done before. And I had set it up on my computer and on my screen, I could see all of the answer choices. And my students who were using their phones told me that they don't see the answer choices. They just see like four blocks on their screen. And so it was confusing for them. And then what we figured out was if they, if they were able to, they could look at my screen and then answer on a phone. Um, and some of them just went ahead and used their, um, use the chat in, in, in our class in Schoology. So they would look at my screen and instead of answering in the Kahoot, they would answer in the chat. So we got it figured out so that everyone could participate. But it was a shock to me that the, the students on the phones weren't seeing the same thing that I was seeing. Uh, Shanna said, learned about everyday edit. Um, yep, everyday edits is a great resource. In fact, it is one of the, um, I did an article actually this week as kind of a lead into the Institute where I talked about four writing resources and everyday edits was one of them. We do that as a regular warm up routine in my class. And I'm glad that got talked about in your groups. That's a great, that's a really great uh, resource. Um, there is just constant learning in class for teachers while trying to learn new things. Yes, I was sharing with Lindsay and Marisa when I'm with my students, I feel like it's a normal part of our class where I make mistakes. I often, um, for some reason, I constantly am zooming my screen up too big so that like suddenly what the students are seeing blows up to like 500% or something. Um, and I do that several times a class by just because I'm a little clumsy with the controls, but I'm just used to it now. And I laugh it off and I tell my students, you know, we make these mistakes. We, we all are gonna make mistakes. And I think you feel a little different when you're in front of your colleagues, but um, definitely always all learning. Um, thanks, Marisa chatted out the link to the article. I know there was also an article, um, another article that Penny wrote about reading resources. Um, so we had a lot of literacy resources this week in the newsletter. In our final uh, minutes here, um, I, I'll get to your comment, Laura. I also want to remind everyone, so the participant folder is on the flyer. So the conference flyer has all of the links for today, including the link to the participant folder. And for this session, again, a PDF copy of the slides is already available, as well as sub several of the resources we talked about. And I will put together a, a resource list with clickable links, and I'll try to get that in there um, later this afternoon, for sure by tomorrow morning, if you wanted that. The, the links that I referred you to, by and large, are on the, um, the slides, but if you wanted to be able to click, I'll put something together. And Marisa has uh, shared out um, a link to Penny's article and a link to the flyer. Laura said, um, Common Lit provides great text to teach and have wonderful conversations that require students to write longer responses and can serve as writing prompts and or opportunities to create longer writing responses. I have not used Common Lit myself very much, Laura, but I know Christine Kelly talks about it a lot. And I know it's a resource that a lot of people really value and I should check it out. Um, one resource that I sometimes go to for longer texts is uh, the Change Agent, that online magazine, the student writing that comes out uh, twice a year by World Ed. Um, and they often do texts with writings and even some paired activities that I, I have found really interesting. Um, yep, that's okay, Laura, I'm glad. To, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I'm not sure about um, the evaluation, Emily, Marisa, would you be able to speak to that for a minute? Sure, yeah, there's going to, there's going to be one survey for the whole day. Okay. So day, day one and day two. So you'll go ahead after the end of the day, you'll be able to fill it out um, for all of the sessions that you went to. Um, and then at that point, when you click submit, you'll get a thank you screen. And the thank you screen will have a link to the CEUs that you can download for yourself. 
Perfect. Okay. So just like a lot of Atlas trainings recently, we do the eval in order to get to our CEUs. Nice. Correct. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. And Marisa also chatted out that there's been three articles about common lit. Matt, um, thank you, Matt. Glad you could be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, the New York Times Learning Network, yes, they have some great graphic organizers um, that I have seen and have thought would be really good to use in class. Nikki Carson says she loves Common Lit. Um, the writing responses go to the teacher for review, grading, and feedback. I did think it was for a little bit higher level readers. Thanks, Nikki. It's nice to have you here. Um, so that is it. It is 1115. Um, I want to remind you all that the next sessions today will be the take and bake sessions, which are uh, shorter sessions. There are 45 minute session be, um, before lunch that are meant to be um, sort of quick and informational. Um, and so those are coming up after a little break at 1130. Okay, thank you all. Thanks for being here. Um, I appreciate your positive comments in the chat. Um, I do hope that you enjoyed this and that you found at least one thing you can use in your class. So thank you. Thank you, everybody.